All right, thanks again, everyone, for joining today's public learning session on Justice 40 and federal funding opportunities and resources. I'm Carly Oro, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm an economic inclusion manager with Emerald Cities Collaborative and based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I co-convene the ARC initiative with Healthcare Without Harm, who you will hear from a little bit later. Um, Emerald Cities Collaborative is a national nonprofit network of organizations working together to advance a sustainable environment while creating sustainable, just, and inclusive economies with opportunities for all. So we work a lot on localizing supply chains and creating economic opportunities for historically disenfranchised entrepreneurs as a strategy for creating more equitable and resilient communities. So we'll just go over a few logistics before we get started, and then we'll go ahead and introduce the organizations and speakers here today, um, as well as what they'll be covering. So for today, all attendees will be muted, and we'll be doing a moderated Q&A for each of the speakers. So feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom call, and then we'll ask um, them right after the speakers then presenting. But if you are more comfortable with a live Q&A, you can also use the raise hand function, and uh, we'll call on you. So if you have any other questions, feel free to message either myself or Sonia, who are the two co-hosts today. So with that, I'll pass it over to Lauren Poor from Healthcare Without Harm. Thanks, Carly, and hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Poor. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a program manager with the Healthy Food and Healthcare team at Healthcare Without Harm, and I'm based in Los Angeles, California. For those of you who are new to Healthcare Without Harm, our mission is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint, becomes a community anchor for sustainability, and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. We've been doing this work for 25 years, and we're working with a national network of more than 1,200 hospitals. For the last five plus years, we've been co-holding Anchors and Resilient Communities with Emerald Cities Collaborative, like Carly mentioned. Some of you might know Anchors and Resilient Communities as ARC, and we address the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health by leveraging the assets and capacities of Bay Area anchor institutions and community-based partners. We focus on expanding community wealth and ownership, improving health outcomes, and strengthening the capacity of communities of color and low and moderate income residents to be resilient in the face of climate and economic disruption. We're so glad to welcome everyone here today, and we're excited to learn from our speakers about different federal funding opportunities and regional resources. There's a lot going on with climate funding and in the energy and food sectors, and we wanted to bring this session together to have a space to share these opportunities with our community. And with that, I think I'll pass it to Sonia. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everyone. And thank you all again for joining today and, par and participating in what I hope will be a rich discussion about emerging federal resources, support, and funding opportunities. My name is Sonia Kakeri. My pronouns are they and she, and I am a policy director and community organizer at Emerald Cities. It's my privilege today to start off this webinar with Elise Taylor and Yakiri, a policy advisor with the U.S. Department of Energy, who co-leads the Communities Local Energy Action Program, or Communities LEAP. She'll be sharing more information about the program, as well as sharing insight into Justice 40 initiatives within the DOE. Elise, turning it over to you. Thanks, Sonia. I appreciate that. Let me go ahead and pull up my screen. Can I see that? Right, yep. Great. Um, so like Sonia said, I am Elise Taylor Anyakiri. I'm a policy advisor at the Department of Energy in the Office of Policy. Um, I help to co-lead communities of LEAP and do a lot of our engagement with state, local, and tribal uh, entities. So I'm going to go over some of the DOE's environmental justice programs, um, starting with an overview of what Justice 40 looks like at the Department of Energy, and then go into a lot more depth about the actual community sleep program. So, you know, environmental justice and equity form the cornerstone of the Biden administration. Um, you know, it's really important that we recalibrate our energy system and it requires a transformative commitment to targeting disadvantaged communities for clean energy investments, new jobs, and new businesses. You know, our team at DOE is really committed to that transformation. And so just for a little background on Justice 40, you know, Justice 40 requires that 40% of the overall benefits 
and certain federal investments, including investments in clean energy and energy efficiency, flow to disadvantaged communities. And so DOE has been just really committed to that. And there are a couple of different things that we are doing to try and meet the, meet the uh, need there. So one of the first things that uh, Justice Board is doing here at DOE is you basically created an energy justice dashboard. It was released in May of this year. And so what it does is it tracks and manages all DOE specific investments and benefits uh, related to the J40 initiative. So it takes every dollar that DOE spends and categorizes and says, how many of these, where are these benefits going? Who received the benefit of all of the spending that we're doing? How many of it, how much of it went to disadvantaged communities? How many of it went to minority serving institutions? And really just helps us to start with a benchmark to say, where are we now and how well are we serving disadvantaged communities now? So we can kind of figure out how much further we have to go to actually meet the justice 40 or the 40% the of benefits falling to disadvantaged communities. And so it was a real eye opener. We weren't, we were nowhere near the 40% that we are now aiming to be at, but it helped us really get a clear picture of where we are and how we can get better. Um, DOE is also doing a few other things. There are a lot of working groups uh, across DOE to try and get better at this issue. I think some of the most important ones are stakeholder engagement working groups. We've been doing a lot to actively improve the way that we interface with communities. The department always has and hasn't always had the best reputation, so we've been very active in engaging with communities, figuring out how we can better engage, uh, taking that very seriously. We also have a metrics working group, which helps us understand how we serve disadvantaged communities and figuring out, well, what exactly does that mean and how are we defining the term and who exactly gets included. Um, we also have an equity working group, which is more internal and it's kind of evaluating equity issues inside of DOE and also a procurement working group to determine and um, to help other, just help people serve the Department of Energy better. So help with in terms of our procurement and contracting process, making sure that we're um, creating opportunities for small businesses and minority businesses. So that's an overview of J40. And now I'm going to give you a deep overview of Communities Leap. Um, so Communities Leap is an effort, has a signature effort by the secretary. She really wanted to be able to um, help uh, disadvantaged communities be a part of the clean energy transition and figure out what does that exactly look like for us. And so this is the program that she rolled out to meet that desire that she had. And so what Communities Leap will do, it's going to provide 24 to 36 selected communities with technical assistance. And that technical assistance will be used to identify local clean energy objectives, core community assets, and what are the data resource requirements. So like the goal is to create a plan you know, built on those objectives and strengths and resources to figure out what exactly does the clean energy transition look like for our community. So uh, funding is not going to be directly provided to the communities, but for funding is provided to the technical assistance providers. That is one important thing to note. And the technical assistance will last for, last for a 12 to 18 month period, um, just depending on the community's action plan and what exactly they would like to cover. So there will be two tracks for the technical assistance. We will have a launch track. And so the launch track is for communities that know they want to pursue clean energy, but they don't really know what that looks like for them or kind of at the very beginning, just now launching and figuring out how do we get down this road. And then we'll also have an accelerate track for communities that have already done some thinking and that might already have a roadmap or a vision document of where they want to go. And we're going to work to assist them in either creating a business plan, a finance plan, or whatever else assistance they need to kind of push their plan forward. Uh, we separated these two tracks as we didn't want communities to have to compete that were in different places of readiness. And so we kind of separated off into two tracks. But the overall goal with both of these help them push forward and figure out how exactly do we move our community forward on this clean energy transition. So in the opportunity announcement, we kind of go through the process. We identify seven pathways that communities can take. So communities can take any of these pathways individually. They can do a mix of these pathways. And we also leave room for people, for communities to suggest alternative pathways to us that meet their needs. But these are the ones that we thought were most likely and so I'll kind of give you an overview of each of these. So the first one is clean energy planning and development. So that's for communities that might be interested in community solar, uh, wind farms or things of that nature, like clean energy planning uh, to include energy storage. Uh, we also have energy efficient buildings and beneficial electrification. So that's more weatherization, increasing the energy efficiency of your buildings, whether that be homes or municipal buildings or schools, um, clean transportation and planning and investment. So that is what does clean transportation look like for our community? How would we want to integrate electric vehicles or other clean technologies? There's also carbon capture and storage if your community is interested in being a carbon capture and storage hub. 
for some of our communities that are former fossil fuel communities or places of heavy extraction, how we might be able to reclaim some of those lands or also get into critical minerals processing is a pathway as well. We also have community resilience microgrids for communities interested in building microgrids to serve their whole community or to support their business community to be more resilient. And then there's also new or enhanced manufacturing. So that's focused on new manufacturing that might be able to support the clean energy transition and the clean energy supply chain or enhanced manufacturing, which is taking manufacturing facilities that are already in your community and figuring out how they could be more efficient or how we can expand them so that creates new opportunities for jobs. Uh, so for communities of interest, um, so the communities of interest for this opportunity are, as kind of I said before, we're interested in tribal nations and territories. Communities in the United States, including tribal nations territories, are eligible to apply if they meet the criteria as follows. 30% of the community population is classified as low income, as well as experience, are experiencing high or severe energy burden, which means that the median spending of household income and energy bills is greater than 6%, as well as one of the following two criteria. So either historical economic dependent on fossil fuel industrial facilities, or environmental justice communities is indicated by high exposure to environmental hazards, pollution, and toxicity. Um, I know these criteria are very specific, so we actually do provide data in the opportunity announcement. If you're reading through the opportunity announcement, which I'll provide a link to on our website, um, we do provide a link where you can kind of look through. We've categorized this information for every uh, census tract in the United States, and so you can look through that to get an idea of if your community is eligible. Um, that data is not a solid in or out, it's, just, it's meant to provide it to kind of help communities get a sense of whether they're eligible or not. As we all know, census tracts don't perfectly line up with communities, so there is flexibility there, and we just like to provide that to kind of assist people in assessing their situation. In terms of eligible entities and people applying to, uh, communities leap. So community applicants are asked to form multi-stakeholder teams. Uh, they're asked to identify a lead organization to represent the team include a community-based organization with a demonstrated track record of working with community stakeholders, include at least one local, tribal, territorial, regional, or state government entity, and include other entities and organizations that together have sufficient authority and influence to ensure the overall success in applying to this technical assistance. So that could be, if, depending on your situation, it could be a local utility, it could be homeowners associations, things, just different groups that might also be necessary to kind of pull this thing together. And we're also strongly encouraging teams to include local economic development officials. It's not a requirement, but we think it would be very helpful. To give you an idea of the process timeline, so we initially released Communities Leap on September 15th and entered a 30-day comment period, and we took comments on the opportunity until October 12th. And then, uh, I guess that last week or two weeks ago on October 25th, the official registration period open and the application officially open. So you can now actually apply for Communities Leap. Um, we will be accepting registrations until December 15th and the application cutoff deadline is December 17th. So right before the holiday season commences and then we expect to announce selections around March 28th. All these dates are kind of subject to change but that's the tentative schedule that we've outlined thus far. This is, a, um, this is the link to our registration page. It looks a little bit different than our main website because it's being hosted by our, um, our partner, the National Energy Technology Lab. But this is an a, a overview of the registration page. In order to apply, you must register. So even if you're not sure whether you want to apply, we encourage people to register. There's no penalty for registering and then not applying. So we definitely encourage people to, if you're interested or you think you might be interested, go ahead and register. And then if you do decide to put an application, you've done what you needed to do because you must register in order to apply. So for the application itself, so the application will ask you some basic summary information about your community, where you're located, the name of your community, those kind of things. Uh, we will also ask you to describe your energy and economic challenges and opportunities so we can get an idea of what kind of problems you're trying to solve and where you're trying to go. A description of the transformative impact of the request of technical assistance, uh, who is on your team, and any letters of commitment those people might provide. The opportunity announcement kind of gives details on each of those requirements. In terms of how communities will be evaluated, we have four main criterion, and the weight of each of those criterion is in the parentheses there. So we're going to be looking at technical merit and viability, um, just in terms of what you're trying to accomplish and what problems you're trying to solve. 
community capacity building. How much is this going to help build capacity in your community? We will judge the multi-stakeholder team composition and capabilities, just how well we think this team is actually going to be able to actually achieve the goal stated. And then also looking at the transformative impact of suggested technical assistance. Um, we might also consider other selection factors. So as you kind of get to the end of the evaluation process, we need to look for a couple of other things. So those things might include geographic and demographic uh, diversity. So just making sure that all the final applicants don't all come from the same part of the US. Um, the extent to which the community represents minority populations, the presence of additional stressors like lack of access to clean energy, uh, vulnerability to severe weather and climate events, and um, shrinking or slow econ growing economies and then just the diversity of pathways chosen. So we're not gonna choose all of our projects to be uh, just in the clean energy. So we'll try and have a diversity of pathways, the ones that we highlighted before. So you're welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, that's, like, that's the Communities Leap website. It's energy.gov backslash Communities Leap. If you wanna download the opportunity announcement or access the registration application link, you can also email us if you have any questions at Communities Leap info at hq.doe.gov. Uh, we can answer any questions that you guys might have, and I'm also able to answer questions now if anybody has any specific questions. So yeah, I don't know if you received any questions. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Of, yeah. Um, thank you so much, Elise, for that really informative presentation. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, we will be sending up a follow-up email with all the resources presented in today's um, presentation. Um, so don't like feel like, oh no, I have to copy and paste or take a screenshot. <laughs> we'll get it to you. Um, yeah, so I don't see any questions in the chat um, or in the queue or any raised hands but I might give another minute. Otherwise we maybe have some questions that we would like to ask for the benefit of the audience as well. Yeah, go um, right ahead. Awesome. Um, let me open that. Um, is there any type of requirement for how many stakeholders or organizations need to be part of the team that applies? Yeah, so we just require there be at least one community-based organization that basically represents the community and then either a some type of governmental entity to also just help you move things forward. Those are the only hard uh, requirements that we have. And then okay. other yep, um, people as needed, yeah. Um, and then Al Weinrub asked, why does there have to be a government entity on the team? For a lot of these things, you usually need a government entity to kind of just push things forward. If you're trying to do like a big clean energy transition uh, or like have a clean energy plan, or clean energy, like uh, deploying like clean energy technology, it also requires some kind of local approval or something like that. So that's why I think it's important to have them as a part of the plan. Um, but you were saying it's only the community-based organization and a lead member that are the requirements, right? So let me go back to that slide. So you must have a community-based organization with a demonstrated track record of working with the community stakeholders and then include at least one government entity, whether that be local, so that could be, you know, a city council, um, or you could go more local than that, just someone with authority within your area. Um, Al follows up with the comment, it represents a lack of confidence in community-based development. Um, is there anything that the DOE is doing to work with communities that don't have access or the best relationships with government entities? Yeah, I mean, that's why we provide a lot of choice there. If you don't have the best working relationship with someone local, you, know, you could work with someone from your region or your state. Um, that could be like your state energy office. There's a lot of options and choices there. And it's not that we don't have trust in community um, building, which just from our experience, like in order, it's oftentimes to move things forward. If we just have the community organization, we find sometimes they don't have enough authority to move some things forward. And so we put that as a requirement just to make sure that we're able to actually able to do the things that we want to do and accomplish them. Awesome. And is there any, um, oh, got another question here. The relevance of research partnerships, and if so, research slash data requirements in the program. Plus, can you share more about the mandates of the laboratory? And I'm going to guess that's as the partner organization. So the research requirements or the, can you say the question again? Uh, sorry, what is the relevance of research partnerships? And if so, the research data requirements in the program. 
Yeah. So we don't necessarily require you to have a research organization be a part of your team in terms of what data that we might need from you. Um, we are working with our technical assistance providers to hopefully be able to pull any kind of community data that we might need. So we don't list that as a hard requirement. We're going to work with um, the Department of Energy and our technical assistance providers to make sure we have whatever data that we need or be able to work with the community to get that data and provide it. Awesome. Um, another question. What if we, a community-based organization, do have the experience and authority and don't need a governmental organization to be successful? That's how we've written out the terms. And at this point, we are we're already kind of set the terms of how the opportunity is going to work. So I think finding a good government, that's just the way the requirements are at this point. Awesome. Um, are there any other questions? And you can also raise your hand. And I apologize if I haven't seen anyone whose hands have been raised. Um, I guess one last question. Are there any uh, programs outside of Communities Leap that DOE has um, to work directly with communities or be the government entity to kind of help technically assist or, or support community-based yeah. programs? Yeah, so DOE has a, a variety of programs to work directly with community. It really just depends on what you're trying to work on. So, you know, we have our Solar Energy Innovation Network. Our, our Office of Solar Programs has a lot of interest in solar development. Um, our manufacturing office has a lot of partnerships to help with improving local manufacturing facilities. The Office of um, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management also has a similar program to communities that are interested in carbon capture and storage, as well as minerals processing. So there's a large variety of programs in this if some of the uh, current legislation for bipartisan infrastructure bill passes, there will be new additional funding at DOE and other programs that will also be available. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, if you don't think LEAP is the right fit for you, but you're interested in something similar, please reach out to us at the email address. And we will also be having office hours on November 9th and December 7th. You can sign up for those on our website. If you have more questions, you just kind of want to go a little bit more in depth, uh, you, you're welcome to follow up with our office hours or at our email address. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elise. And I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. Um, I'll give it another second. Okay, awesome. Um, now I would like to um, introduce, oh, I lost my script. Um, there we go. Um, now I'd like to introduce y'all to Michelle Moore, the CEO of Groundswell and a co-founder of the Justice 40 Accelerator, who is here today to share insights on how communities can connect with the Biden-Harris Justice 40 initiative and some exciting potential updates related to reconciliation in the bipartisan infrastructure package. Michelle, I'm going to hand it off to you. Would it even be a Zoom call if somebody didn't start talking before they were off mute? Um, but it is a blessing to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for sharing a little time for me to share a little bit with y'all. And um, I would ask for your forbearance on two things. Number one, I have some allergy situation going on and cough on the occasion. So I will apologize in advance for um, muting and coughing possibly during this presentation. And then I'm also on travel and in a super bland hotel room. So apologies for the bad lighting, y'all. But uh, excited to share some stuff with you guys today. Um, the presentation that I have, I'm not going to click through every slide. I'm just going to use a few on background, but then the full PDF will be available for everybody for reference. I'm going to pop up a couple of websites too. And um, I'm going into what I have to share today as well. I um, also just want to give you a little bit of context in terms of where I come from the conversation. You know, Groundswell is very grateful to be one of the um, one of the founders of the Justice 40 Accelerator. You know, we are a, a, a small nonprofit ourselves, a relatively small. We've grown a little bit in the past year or so, but we actually have the experience of trying to work with the federal government on, um, a, on a grant doing important work to advance more equitable um, solar project financial structures, but the grant had a big match requirement and managing it has just about crushed us. <laughs> We're grateful for it, but um, you know we have lived this experience ourselves and which is really part of what inspired our participation in the accelerator. And then I myself am um, an unrecovered policymaker I served in the Obama White House on the energy and climate team at CEQ and at the Office of Management and Budget. 
and served on uh, the Biden Harris transition team as well. So, um, so anyway, just that's a little bit about me in terms of uh, where I come from and the expertise that I can share in this conversation. Um, but just to, let's see, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Justice 40 Accelerator and what we're trying to do. And, um, and then I'm going to shift over and talk a little bit about what we hope to have upcoming in reconciliation. In addition, so most important thing about the Justice 40 Accelerator is our vision. And um, there are five core partner organizations, Partnership for Southern Equity, um, which is the lead partner, um, ourselves at Groundswell, uh, the Solutions Project, uh, which has provided funding. You know, they're the organization you apply to for Justice 40 Accelerator funding. Elevate uh, out of Chicago and Hummingbird, uh, which is a black woman owned business in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which is our partner and a lot of the infrastructure behind the Justice 40 Accelerator. And we are all aligned behind this vision. And um, I will break from my normal approach and take the time to read this slide because it is important. Anchored in love, service, and a sincere commitment to frontline communities, the Justice 40 Accelerator seeks to leverage this moment to radically reimagine the existing government resource delivery system as a restorative and reparative framework that better supports black and historically disinvested communities of color. And restorative and reparative framework are bold for a reason. And that's really the spirit with which we come to this work. Um, we have uh, beliefs, you know, a set of beliefs that back up the way that we work as well, you know, including that climate justice is racial justice and that the transformative potential of the Justice 40 initiative is ultimately to shift the whole paradigm of federal funding. You know, so we're thinking about this work in the near term and we're thinking about this work in the long term too. So let's see, um, there are three things that we're working on. You know, the action is really helping to support and prepare frontline communities to win. And by win, I mean, very simply like get that money, you know, the money that needs to go for the purposes for which it was intended and we want to share our collective experiences and the resources that we've been able to gather together, you know, to help frontline organizations get the money that's been committed to them. Ultimately, also, we want to influence the system and Partnership for Southern Equity is on point in this work. And that means mapping the system, you know, understanding where these resourcing chains have roots themselves, you know, in systemic racism, um, because you can't change the landscape unless you understand what the landscape is. And then ultimately, we want to see transformation, um, educating and, and engaging uh, policymakers and decision makers for lasting change. So um, where we are right now, and like I said, I'm not going to read every slide to y'all. Um, we have been working on getting some money out the door ourselves. So uh, one of the first things that we did as a team in that action category, right, um, was to really focus on raising dollars and raising dollars to be able to provide grants directly to frontline organizations, project pre-development funding, and then to organize, you know, the support that's necessary to go after federal dollars too. things like grant writing, um, which in the, all the polling that we did of people who had participated participated in the um, organizing calls that we held. Grant writing was actually the number one request. 68% um, of those that we work, uh, th those that we surveyed were looking for grant writing technical support. Um, we're also working to put together a network of allies, values aligned organizations, and that may be a little bigger. You know, they may be a little, um, you know, have a little bit more experience working with the federal government, but who would be able to partner you know, with organizations that were seeking Justice 40 funding, you know, if the best and most advantageous position was to be a subcontractor as opposed to the primary contractor of, the federal, of a federal agency. But again, we want to make sure that the people that we're working with and the organizations that we're bringing in as allies are values aligned, values aligned behind that vision statement, values aligned behind those beliefs. Now, I'm going to stop my share and skip over to another screen so you're exciting. Uh, different application. Um, where are you? Uh oh, let's see. Well, we may not be doing that, y'all, because it's not giving me the op opportunity on my screen share. But um, you can go to justice40accelerator.org. And this is the website for the initiative. And um, we've already provided funding in the form of $25,000 project, $25,000 project pre development grants to 52 organizations around the country. 
and the diversity of the organizations and the diversity of the climate resilient infrastructure that they're seeking to develop is so incredibly exciting. Um, it includes clean energy projects, surely, um, but it also includes stormwater management, green infrastructure, uh, sustainable and resilient food systems, um, sustainable agriculture, uh, blue, blue ocean agriculture, so ocean agriculture. I know that's not the right term, um, but uh, just an incredible diversity of projects that we're already working with on a weekly basis and on a daily basis, you know, to help to answer the questions that folks have, you know, from how do you get your DUNS number, PS, I don't even know what DUNS number stands for, uh, to be able to be ready to make that initial federal application to, um, let's see, you know, how do you, how do you find a source of data, you know, for the kind of data requirements that federal applications often have, you know, to be able to support a request, you know, to really beginning to understand, right, what's the best federal agency to work with? You know, DOE is doing some great stuff and, you know, they have energy in their title and everything. Um, and so they quickly come to mind as a potential federal agency to work with. But in fact, the Biden-Harris administration Justice 40 initiative spans the entirety of the federal government. It is an all-in effort. And sometimes there are other agencies that are a little bit easier to work with as a starting point. And I'll give you a specific example in terms of um, an update on some of this work that we've been doing with the infrastructure bill, with the reconciliation bill. As I shared, um, you know, everything that we're doing in the accelerator is really focused on serving frontline community organizations. So we do a lot of listening, we do a lot of learning, we do a lot of surveying, you know, to really give us instruction on how we need to be engaging. And some of that work is focused on policymakers. You know, from a service and support perspective, it's bringing policy leaders in to brief accelerator participants on um, policy plans, of general knowledge on kind of how things work and just equipping folks. Um, but it's also working to influence and inform, you know, policymakers to create better, more tailored options. I mean, just like the questions that were in the chat about, you know, why you have to have local government or state government involved is, is one example of things that we had heard loud and clear as being something that was an obstacle, you know, for frontline organizations um, and something that, uh, you know, often it leads to perverse results. I mean, I know, again, even from Groundswell's own experience, sometimes local government procurement rules, you know, really prevent you from achieving the justice aims that you may have with your project. So they can be a, a hindrance uh, even more than a help. So, you know, we were very grateful to be able to work in advising Senator Markey's office uh, and a number of other co-sponsors on a piece of legislation called the LIFT Act that got rolled into the reconciliation bill uh, with the support of Senator Schumer's office, uh, who's been a great champion for this. And um, obviously things are still unfolding on reconciliation. Um, but at last check, uh, this was still in, the provisions were still in, and we feel confident that it will, that it will be there in, in the wash too. But um, bottom line is uh, the, the, the uh, result is $240 million at the Economic Development Administration, uh, which is part of Commerce Department. And that $240 million is specifically tagged to support up to half a million dollar grants each for project pre-development for frontline communities to develop climate resilient infrastructure. 50% of that money must be spent in under-resourced communities. There are 0% match requirements and funding can go directly to community-based organizations. It does not have to go through a city or state and you do not have to be working with a city or state to get the money. And so that is just one example of um, many pre-development um, you know, opportunities that we see coming forward in reconciliation bill. And it's one that we've worked to really tailor you know, to the priorities that we've heard from the frontline groups that we've been working with and surveying through the accelerator you know, to make sure that um, we're eliminating obstacles as we move forward, you know, as opposed to having really great intentions with um, the Justice 40 policy itself, but then having administrative or statutory obstacles to really realizing them. Because sometimes those um, state and local government requirements where you have to have a state or local government partner, or the money has to go through a state or local government entity, you know, actually originate in the laws themselves. So agencies 
don't have any flexibility to do it any other way. And um, so there are lots of fronts that we're working on all at once, you know, to help to do our part. And I say this in humility um, to make sure that the Justice 40 dollars are getting out the door in a way that is really advancing reparative and restorative aims. And I'm going to shift back over to the PowerPoint presentation now. You guys will recognize some pictures in common if you took a moment to chime in on the website. Um, to just go back to a, a couple of other things I wanted to show on the Justice 40, just as it relates to my, you know, unrecovered former policymaker self. Um, on the Justice 40 accelerator, it's or the Justice 40 policy itself. Um, it's worth highlighting that um, that the result of this policy should impact funding across the entirety of the government, essentially. Uh, energy, certainly, water. You know, water means EPA and the Department of the Interior, as well as USDA funding, waste mitigation. You know, that is EPA as an agency, but that could also be the Department of Transportation and USDA as well. Housing, which is HUD and the US Department of Agriculture. Transit transportation is DOT. They spend more money than a lot of the other agencies combined. Uh, local business development, which is Small Business uh, Administration, but it's also the Department of Commerce and EDA, which is the Economic Development Administration is what EDA stands for. Uh, so it is really a whole of government approach and there will be many doors you know, that are possible to go through. You know, some of the, the executive order that this was embodied in that came out on, on January the 27th and included some very specific dates and deadlines for implementation. And for instance, the administration has already issued very specific OMB guidance um, from the White House saying, hey, agencies, you know, these are the programs that you've got to begin implementing the Justice 40 in immediately. And um, I can actually include in my follow up note a link to that guidance, but it specifically pinpoints, you know, the programs, the agencies and the offices that are going to be moving forward first uh, to implement the Justice 40. What that means as a practical matter is that those are the first agencies and the first programs that are going to have funding opportunities that would be available for these purposes, you know, beginning as you're hearing from BOE now, you know, in the 2022 fiscal year for the federal government, obviously accelerating once a reconciliation is passed with all these additional infrastructure dollars that are being um, spent. And then, you know, the administration has also tasked itself with accountability, which by February 2022, the White House Office of Management and Budget will publish a scorecard on agency progress. Now, I love me a scorecard being an OMB alum myself, um, but this will be some transparency. You know, this is the kind of thing that the DOE reporting that you just saw will be rolling up into. So you will be able to take a look and see, is your government doing the right job? Is, it, is your government following up to the promise that has, it has made, you know, to spend money in this way? And um, so, you know, we can look forward to uh, more specific opportunities, at least one, you know, funded in, in reconciliation now that doesn't have any of the local government and match requirements associated with it that can be such a huge stumbling block. And um, that by February of next year, we'll also be able to take a look and see how everybody's doing. Now, as it relates to the Justice 40 Accelerator, you know, the, the collaboration that we're running that is really in service to of frontline organizations going after this money. Um, the Partnership for Southern Equity was blessed with funding through the Bezos Earth Fund um, to be able to add a second cohort. So we just funded 52 groups with $25,000 and a whole lot of support each. And uh, early next year, date still TBD, um, we will be able to announce uh, funding for a second cohort. So another round of funding um, that would be philanthropic funding, no strings attached uh, to um, enable, uh, I mean, essentially, right, it's to be able to pay yourself and uh, to be able to put the time and effort that's necessary into creating these often like 100 page um, long uh, federal grant applications to begin pulling these dollars down. And I would also just say as a testimony, for anyone on this call whose organizations may be interested in uh, going after federal funding but may not have experience working with the federal government before. While our DOE grant um, is, was a challenge, it was just a challenge, you know, for a small organization as ours was, you know, even though as my uh, colleague Crystal Virgil and I always say, we're, you know, small but mighty, um, still a lot of work that goes into the administrative 
the requirements, but it is worth it um, because it helps you build capacity because oftentimes the grants are multi-year awards. Because once you have a working relationship with a federal agency, they can help connect you to other peers and colleagues across other agencies and across the field, you know, beyond what you may see every day in your, in your ordinary work. And um, once you're in relationship with a federal agency, they're also able to take um, your experience, what you share with them, you know, about the experience working with the federal government to use that to improve their own performance. So um, it is worth it. It is worth the effort. And um, in humility, the Justice 40 Accelerator is here to um, hopefully help more organizations push up, get that money, and um, use it for a good purpose towards reparation and restoration of our communities. And I will conclude my remarks there. Thank you so much, Michelle, and congratulations on the second cohort. Can't yeah, wait for that you. date to come out. That's really exciting. Um, I'd like to open it up to our attendees. If you have any questions, to so throw them in the chat, or if you'd like to ask them live, feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, and while folks are doing that, um, Michelle, the word benefits is weird. Yes. <laughs> Can yes. you tell us your experience with that word and how it's kind of related to how you've interacted with how agencies are defining it and measuring it? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, it is benefits is a weird word, but, um, you know, if from a, again, this is with my former OMB hat on, if you just talked about dollars in the federal government, um, you would be working with a relatively small pool of funds compared to the number of the amount of money that the federal government actually pushes out into the economy for these different types of programs. Because a lot of the money that the federal government spends on transit and transportation, for instance, is just formula funding. Um, the same is true for a lot of HUD money. It's just that, hey, here's this money and divvy it up among the states, you know, at, on a percentage basis on population or you know, based on certain other you know, economic data. And so when we talk, when the, when the, um, you know, from a federal perspective, if you say that 40% of the benefits you know, have to go for these purposes, that means that the accountability for how the dollars get spent also follows the formula funding through. So it means that the, that the institutions, including state and local governments that may get that formula funding also have to report back up, you know, how those dollars are being used for purposes of the Justice 40. So it creates a lot of complexity um, in terms of implementation and measurement. And as some of my attorney friends sometimes say, like words like benefits can also be what you would be, what you would call weasel words, right? Weasel words because it allows you to wheel out of stuff. Um, but in this particular instance, utilizing the term benefits is all about, you know, addressing a, a broader pool of dollars going out the door. Um, but uh, I, I would say at the same time, that is also why it's so very important to focus on direct funding programs, you know, where dollars like an EDA can go directly to community-based organizations without having to pass through lots of other hands, because making sure that those dollars are being spent um, towards Justice 40 goals on a dollar per dollar basis, you know, is where you're going to get more leverage as opposed opposed to having lots of people trying to interpret the Justice 40 as the dollars flow down, um, we really want to see community organizations directly equipped and funded, you know, to build their own visions, you know, as opposed to the usual suspects or as in, you know, DC, the folks you affectionately, call, maybe not so affectionately call Beltway Bandits, you know, the organizations that are like super professional at going after federal funding, you know, we don't want them just to be like yesterday's carbon organizations, today's equity organizations, you know, claiming that they're solving all the, um, all the Justice 40 policy challenges and gobbling up all those dollars themselves. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we have a comment that if you have a comment to respond to, I think we'd appreciate. Most government agencies do not release funds in advance, but only after the work is complete. This yeah. is a non-starter for most organizations. Yes, absolutely. And we have experienced that as well. Um, a couple of things that we're, um, you know, that we're looking at, at, you know, in terms of the accelerator is, you know, where are there opportunities that may be um, not fully implemented across philanthropy? You know, there are some philanthropies that will um, essentially front you the money uh, while you're waiting to be able to build the federal government um, for the time and materials contracts, essentially, that many federal government awards are. But then we're 
also engage with the federal agencies and advocating for more program dollars to be set aside to be able to be paid up front. You know, for some agencies, you know, they have to go through a regulatory process to be able to update the way their programs function so that in, you know, for instance, for certain sizes of organizations or certain types of grants that they would be able to pay up front um, rather than paying in arrears. And then for the EDA program, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, that we thought EDA was such a, a great agency to focus on is because EDA's organic authority and organic authority is that that just relates to the statute that established the agency, like what was their job in the first place. In EDA's job in the first place um, was to support community economic development in places that have been left behind. And, um, you know, to do that directly, to do it on a regional basis and to link it to infrastructure. So, you know, agencies like EDA um, or agencies, administrations like EDA, you know, that have those kind of responsibilities and their organic authority do have the ability to fund up front. And, um, you know, so we're, we're working not just with them, but to identify other specific opportunities, you know, to try to push folks, you know, to those. Um, while also advocating pretty strenuously with the agencies that, hey, like, you guys can't say this is what you want to do and then have a bunch of administrative barriers to achieving it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and we have another question comment. Since most of reconciliation infrastructure funds will go to city and states, what guidance will be attached to ensure that communities are at the table to determine how the funds are used? I don't know the specifics as it relates to particular agencies, um, but I do know that that benefits, you know, commitment that 40% of the benefits will go to frontline communities or to disadvantaged communities is the terminology that the Biden-Harris administration used, um, that agencies will have to issue that guidance. They will have to prepare that instruction so that they're able to manage and measure the direction that their president has given them by executive order, uh, which is their responsibility. And, um, you know, going to that OMB guidance, uh, it's, it's signed out by the whole of the White House, but it's issued from OMB because it's about how you spend money. It uh, does pinpoint which agencies and programs are going to be focused on first. And um, if you look at that program list and focus your questions, you know, particularly if there's a program that seems like it may be aligned with the work that you do or the work that you envision, and um, those program offices should be able to answer those questions for you. And then, um, you know, as we move forward, that is something that the accelerator team very much has on their on our you know radar screen as well. Um, so we'll always seek to be able to bring those information in and um, basically do what we're told, you know, by the uh, cohort members, by the people that we're here to serve. I'm sorry, I don't have a more detailed answer about that, but um, each agency and each program you know, will be responsible, accountable, measured with a public scorecard, you know, reported on how well they did on that front. Um, a follow-up comment. Yes. The key is to engage directly with the community to determine what benefits matter most to the community versus government telling us what the benefits are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I know that, um, you know, one other piece of infrastructure that the Biden-Harris administration put in place to try to do this um, although, again, and this is me speaking as a citizen and as a leader of Groundswell, just based on my past experience, um, you know, sometimes the, you know, the federal government can be a little bit like a, it's like a 19th century government in a 21st century world. You know, the, the federal government lives with a lot of very old and arcane rules and uh, regulations you know, many of which were actually formulated and implemented at a time when segregation and racial discrimination was literally the law of the land. You know, so there are some real deep systemic roots that need to be pulled up with this as well. Um, but uh, in addition to the National Environmental Justice um, uh, Advisory Committee at EPA, there's now a White House Advisory Committee on Environmental Justice that CEQ and a woman named Cecilia Martinez is leading there. And, um, you know, so, the, and they have a specific responsibility in their charter to advise the implementation of these policies across the whole of the federal government. So that is a, a, you know, a special purpose committee, if you will, that the federal government, that the White House put in place to be able to listen actively and um, which helps them follow their rules, like their rules and regulations that they have to achieve. So I would say, you know, Sonia, um, you know, in terms of, you know, concerns and ideas about how the federal government 
consultant is, is doing to as opposed to listening and doing with, um, I would encourage you to look at who's on that White House Advisory Committee and reach out to them um, because that is a specific point of connection, you know, that the White House itself, you know, has with communities to be able to listen and implement according to the feedback and the guidance they get while also, you know, living up to their legal and regulatory responsibilities and how they prepare and issue guidance. So I agree. And um, that is an avenue to implement your thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I'm not seeing any more questions or raised hands, but I will give it another couple seconds. Um, and just really appreciate the work that you and the Justice 40 Accelerator are doing and very much looking forward to sending out the announcement of the second cohort to folks <laughs> when the time comes. Um, okay, I think we're gonna move on. Um, finally, it is such a great pleasure to welcome Julie Klaus, the director of the Small Business Administration San Francisco office, but who also has experience in DC at the Small Business Administration, Small Business Administration's headquarters. Um, while she'll be focusing on regional resources specific to the Bay Area, she's, knowledge she's knowledgeable about the larger SBA world and can share insight to folks looking to connect with the agency. Take it away, Julie. Thank you, Sonia. Hello, everyone. So I feel like we're taking a little bit of a pivot here. Um, I'm going to talk to you more about the resources that are really um, for small businesses themselves. These are not necessarily things that community, you know, development groups tap into more so the, the businesses themselves. But I think um, what I like to do, since this is kind of an introductory, um, is give you start with the high level and then drill down on a couple of the programs that I think um, are going to blend well with the conversations we've had here with more of a, the equity lens. And that is a big theme in our agency as well. Um, right now, we're still kind of up to here with COVID recovery, <laughs> but as we start to get into the more what I call traditional programming and when we see what what comes to us through the infrastructure bill when it passes, what will be in our, our final appropriation, because we're still operating under a continual, continuing resolution right now. But when we see what's in there, um, hopefully that'll be, enable us to expand and enhance some of the programming. I'm gonna try to talk and share my screen at the same time. We'll see if we can do this. Um, but I also, um, in that vein, there's a lot of questions I can't answer yet um, that I'm sure you have, but I at least want to just start sharing some information uh, for people who maybe aren't as familiar with SBA and what it is we do. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot more visibility, obviously, since uh, COVID, but we actually... Um, our unique agency and that's that we're independent. Uh, we're not part of commerce. Uh, we're not part of any of the big guys. We are an independent agency and our administrator is cabinet level. So she does have the ability to speak directly with the, with the administration and keep them informed uh, about the needs of the small business uh, community. The way SBA is structured, um, we have a very extensive field network. So we obviously are headquartered in Washington, DC, like, like every agency, but we have at least one district office in every state. There are 68 across the country. There are multiple here in California since we're obviously a big state. Um, and out of my office, my team and I cover 14 counties, kind of Northern coastal California. So I think I have the best count, uh, best uh, territory in the whole country, but you know, I might be a little biased here. <laughs> um, but everything that we do kind of falls into four buckets, um, it, whether it's be the access to capital, government contracting assistance, business um, development, business advising, and the disaster assistance, which is the world we've been living in for the last 20 months. Um, Again, I'm gonna go really quickly on some, some big picture things and then drill down on a couple programs that I think have some nice ties um, to the conversation that uh, we've had and then um, conversations that I understand some of the, the Emerald Cities initiatives and some focal areas and efforts. So in the disaster, I'll just start with disaster first since that's kind of been foremost in everybody's mind and all of the, additional funding and specialty programs that were created through the CARES Act and Economic Aid Act and ARPA and all the different rounds of legislation. Most of that is finished now. 
with the exception of the COVID idle economic injury disaster loan. That is still available and that is actually available for um, businesses and nonprofits. And that is a working capital loan. It is a loan, it is not forgivable, but it is a very low interest favorable term loan to help businesses and nonprofits um, you know, remain operational, pay staff, pay your bills and stuff until you can get back to a point where you're able to um, recoup your revenue or get back to a more stable, stable revenue stream. Just highlighting that um, because that's a, a topic of uh, the one of the number one asked questions, like what money can I still tap into? But generally speaking, we do have a lot of financial assistance programs, and these are for small businesses. And the regular financial assistance programs are for for-profit small businesses. That goes back to what Michelle is saying about, you know, government sometimes being, or agencies sometimes being limited to what's legislated. The definition in um, the Small Business Act of a small business is a for-profit entity. So don't have a lot of wiggle room on that. But we do uh, actually offer a lot of different financing, um, whether you're looking for micro lending of 50,000 or less, all the way up through venture capital. Um, most people don't realize we actually have venture capital arm as well. But what I like to highlight um, here is in the microfinancing and in our, our government, government guaranteed lending programs, we do have a lot of specialty organizations that participate. Um, and so here in California, knowing some of the food initiatives and things that are happening, I did want to highlight like one group here, uh, California Farm Link, which is a partner with SBA. Um, they offer guaranteed loans up to 250,000. Um, and they also participate in the micro lending space. Uh, they are you know, becoming well-versed with SBA programs, but they're also already well-versed with the USDA, Department of Agriculture programs. And they're in a unique spot because they participate with both agencies that they can often blend the programs. So it's really great for our farmers um, and ranchers and those who may, you know, may not have been able to utilize SBA to support all of the activities that they're looking to do. Um, but then uh, with, with a group like FarmLink, and I'm sure there's others around the country that are similar, um, they can blend the two to help support an entire project, fund a project that a, a farmer or a rancher might be interested in. California FarmLink does focus, you know, on the immigrant population and helping people of color and everything acquire land and then also build their farming business. So taking their experience working on farms to helping them try to transition to ownership and uh, being uh, self, you know, self-employed and self um, generating their own uh, self uh, net worth. Um, the an example of one of this in action. Um, usually, the fast and quick way to distinguish between do I go to USDA for funding or SBA for funding if you're a farmer or rancher is if it's supporting the actual like growing, <laughs> it's usually USDA. If it's supporting anything else, it's probably SBA. So if it's manufacturing or any sort of production or distribution or anything like that, it can be SBA funding. Um, one example where I had a nice blend of the two was a, an olive um, farm, if you will, in Southern California that um, also went into the production of making their own olive oils and producing those olive oils. So they wanted to expand on some of the land and the farm. So to get some land acquisition, to build a new greenhouse, to help with some of their production. Um, they were able to use both programs. To, to the borrower, it looked like one you know, seamless transaction behind the scenes, it was actually two. Um, and that's what a group like California Farmly, because they specialize in that, was able to do. Um, so I know that's one example and a long way of, of sharing that with our capital programs, uh, financing programs, um, it's not just the traditional big box you know, multinational lenders that are out there. They there and they do offer our programs, but there's a lot of CDFIs, even more so coming in credit unions and some other community-based, um, you know, uh, nonprofit lenders that participate in these programs as well. Usually the nonprofit lenders are capped at the up to $250,000 loans, but they're great avenues for really helping support uh, communities because they're mission-based as opposed to, um, you know, you following credit formulas and all of that. They really want to support uh, the different communities that they serve. Um, I also, and I'm going to have a slide on this in a minute, but um, uh, the SBIR and STTR, which I think has a great tie-in with the um, 
uh, the, you know, any sort of climate change research or other things that are happening out there. And I think we hopefully will see some movement in this program as far as funding for the different agencies to support efforts as well. Um, let me just jump forward for a second. Uh, the, the SBIR program is actually seed funding. It is grants um, to support research and development on a lot of different areas. So SBA facilitates the program, but we are not, we don't get all the funding. We are, there are 11 federal agencies, the big guys like the DODs and uh, energy <laughs> being one participate in this. And they are supposed to provide or earmark a certain percentage of their R&D dollars to go to small businesses. And sorry, I have an ambulance coming by. Um, but yeah. <laughs> This program is meant to um, help a small business who has got, you know, the idea or the, the ability to develop um, not just technology, it, it can be more than that, but it tends to be a lot of technology driven things, something that the government needs, but also something that has potential for commercialization. So it's kind of a two pronged approach. It can be seed funding to help build out that take that idea to prototyping to um, testing and development, and then eventually into commercialization. Uh, the best example of this, um, I should look for a clean energy example, but the best example I have is actually a company called iRobot, which I think most people are familiar with. They uh, started their, their SBIR um, funded project was for the military. The military needed a battlefield robot that could be um, go out and sweep for mines. Uh, so something that could be deployed literally in the battlefield. So they took that, te that technology was deployed for, I think it was Department of Army. Um, but then the commercialization aspect of that was the Roomba, our little vacuum cleaner that sweeps our floors. So that's, a, I think, one of the best examples of how this, what this program is intended to do is to help start and seed fund something that the government needs but then hopefully something that can be commercialized at some point as well. And there's gonna be hopefully more funding in this program um, because climate change and, and um, tackling some of those strategies is so important right now that I do believe there'll probably be additional funding to support those efforts in particular. Um, and then with this program, it again, it's for small businesses. Um, the SBIR part, they do not need to be tied to a university or any other research in institution. It is for the small business. The STTR tends to usually have a university tie or some sort of other educational tie, but SBIR, if you haven't heard of it, is definitely a program I think to look into because I think there's hopefully going to be additional um, opportunities in that program or through that program for small businesses to develop some of their emerging ideas. I'm just gonna backtrack. Um, the two other buckets that I wanted to quickly also talk about, um, I'll go into first the business advising and education. So we do offer free business advising for small businesses. Um, they can go one time, they can go hundred times, they'll never be charged. Um, and we have a bunch of partners that hopefully maybe you've heard of with the Small Business Development Centers, our SPORE programs, women business centers, and we even have a veteran business outreach center here in Northern California. Um, one that is not on here yet um, is, because it's emerging, is community navigators. And so this is a new approach. It is a pilot. Uh, the awards were just let. They've announced the 51 grant recipients of that, but the program isn't like fully launched yet. Um, what this is, is, a, is a, more of a hyper-local focus on working with businesses, and in particular, the communities that maybe have not traditionally accessed or have easily accessed SBA resources. So this was a chance to work with um, what we call a hub organization, who's then going to have spokes that are community-based, grassroots-based, and hopefully trusted organizations within the different communities already working with those communities and trying to work with them to help bring SBA programming and resources to these communities to show them how, you know, how they have access. Um, it has also helped that it'll come overcome some of the barriers that we know that are out there, whether it be a language barrier, uh, people just struggling, you know, to understand what this, what this is all about, uh, whether it just be an educational barrier because they never had heard of SBA, maybe we're, maybe they're utilizing different streams um, to get their info and we're just not 
in those streams yet. Um, but it's also meant to get you know into communities that and maybe we're just reluctant to use a government resource uh, for any number of reasons. Um, I think we all know from you know immigrant populations that maybe came from a country where the government was you know not so friendly and helpful uh, that there there's a distrust of government resources. So this is called Community Navigators. I think starting in December and moving forward, you're going to hear a lot more about it. It is a pilot. So they're not everywhere yet, but it is a chance to see how well this model works in the business development space. Uh, and hopefully if it works as well as we all hope, it'll, it'll have received additional funding and be expanded. So there'll be more coming out. And even here in Northern California, like we don't have a hub organization in, based in Northern California, but we will definitely have spoke organizations that will be working in Northern California. So there'll be more coming out about that. Um, and and definitely, even you know, my my team will be engaging with those organizations as we as we get the list together of who all those folks will be as well. And then the last thing I just want to mention was government contracting because I think that um, for many businesses, especially if they're um, looking either for new lines of revenue um, or if they're um, they offer some services or, or with the infrastructure bill coming out, we perceive more contracting opportunities, hopefully becoming available, trying to fight to make sure the small businesses can get their, their fair share. There are a couple programs. Um, we could be spending hours talking about it, but I'll try to drill down to the one that I think is really uh, what I perceive, consider the most robust of our government certification programs of the litany here, this 8A business development program. This is for businesses that are owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals or group of individuals. They have to have at least 51% ownership. Um, and the social and economic disadvantage, they, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both. So it is for social disadvantage uh, is if you are in one of the, the groups that Congress has already recognized as a minority group, you automatically can qualify. But it is really, there's a lengthy definition in our regulations you can read, but it's really for people who, um, who may have not have had access to the more traditional resources um, and or maybe have been disadvantaged in that way. Um, people can always write a narrative to justify why they think they fit into the social disadvantage category. Um, but if you are a member of, uh, if you are self-identifies African-American, Hispanic, American, um, Asian American, Pacific Islander, uh, Native, Indigenous peoples, South Asian, there's a lot of groups that are have a presumption of social disadvantage. And the economic disadvantage is exactly what it is. As it's, and I, we look at the owners themselves and their personal net worth. And we do, we do make an adjustment to the net worth, but typically speaking, it has to be less than 750,000 in order to participate, qualify and participate in this program. This program is actually a business development program. So while it has contracting benefits and certifications, it's really its goal is to help businesses break into the federal contracting space and learn how to be successful there. Um, so there's lots of training and education, technical assistance, some one-on-one, -on -one, some in group settings, some through uh, electronic and other digital tools that are available. And then there's access to some other resources like the ability to joint venture with maybe a slightly larger or more experienced company to help teach that business how, how to win those bids and be successful so that by the end of these nine years that they're in this program, they can go out and compete in their own right and, and full and open or at least amongst the small business pool a little more successfully. Um, the nice thing with this program too, when I talked about um, uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds on contracting, but they have something called um, we have set aside, which means that an agency can set aside the competition just for participants in the 8A program. So you have businesses that are similarly situated com competing against each other for the contract, but there's also a sole source authority. Um, and this means, uh, I'm going to 
oversimplify it a little bit, but it's pretty close. To, if, if the business has gone out and done some market research and um, approached a federal agency, given them their cap capability statement and said, hey, give them their sales pitch, say, this is what I can do for you. Like you should, you should hire me because I do X, Y, and Z and I do it better, faster, smarter than whoever you're using now. And the agency says, you know what? You do. I, I like what you, uh, your pitch, and I have a need for these services. They can do a direct award, basically, as long as the contract is under $4 million in most instances. So it, it avoids competition altogether. So if, an age, or if a business has gone out and marketed themselves well, an agency can do uh, basically a direct procurement award, a sole source award to these 8A firms. So I think that's a huge... Um, it makes life easier for the agency. They don't have to go through all the procurement hoops and competition, but it also gives the ability for these agency or these small businesses, sorry, a chance to um, work on, you know, get an award and perform. Typically, they tend to be the smaller awards, but hey, as you're starting out, that's, that's okay. Uh, and then... I'm going to, I know I've talked a lot and I can go back through if there's any particular programs um, that I talked about or things that people have a particular interest in. Um, I'm happy to like talk more in depth. I wanted to kind of just give you the big broad brush so that you kind of understood the, the world of SBA and everything that we can offer. But then, you know, there's lots of ways that I see ties into um, probably what many of you as organizations are trying to accomplish. And if you are partnering or working with small businesses, you know, the encouragement to tap into some of these resources as you're, you're moving forward with your plans and, and development. Uh, I can, let's see, stop sharing, or I can go back to the main, the main screen here. Um, well, thank you so much, Julie. I I feel like I knew a little bit about SBA and now I feel like I'm like, oh, great. I want to go talk to my local SBA. <laughs> um, we do have some questions already in the chat for you. Um, does the Small Business Association businesses support help food companies get various specialized food certifications or are they just general business certifications? Yeah, so most of those certifications, at least as I understand it, are local, whether it be state or maybe a local um, thing. So yes, definitely um, through our small business development centers and others. And actually here in Northern California, we our small business development center has a specialty um, restaurant group. So they work exclusively with the, it's not just traditional restaurants, but anybody in food service, specialty foods. And that's exactly one of the things they do is they have these programs to help train you on what the requirements are. So if you, for some of you, you may have to go take a test and things like that. So they'll get you prepped and ready for that. Um, and then they can also, you know, pair you with an advisor that has that background and experience to help you with they're not going to do it for you, but they will definitely help guide you through the process. So that's why when um, when I talk about the business advising we have, um, I think it's one of the most invaluable things that we offer because it is free assistance and with the programs, whether it be SBDC or even SCORE, um, they really try to pair you with somebody who either has the same kind of industry experience or is a specialist if you have you know, particular issues, maybe with HR, maybe you're going to hire your first employees and you want to make sure you do it the right way legally and make sure all your I's are dotted, T's crossed, um, a patron with an HR expert or you know, marketing issues, whatever it is, they try to um, match you so that you get an advisor who has that level of expertise. So yeah, food service here in Northern California, we're really lucky because we do have this expert team. They're, they don't exist everywhere, but, um, but here they're a really great group. So I definitely encourage um, people to check them out or send, send people their way. Awesome. And then there's a lot of interest in community solar development. How can the SBA help? So I think different ways, I think um, it depends, I guess, on what the initiative might look like. Um, and if there is an organization that is bringing together small businesses to help support it, and those small businesses need some uh, financial support or other things in order to, to deliver on, on the solar development project, um, we can definitely be there to help with the financial support. Um, 
not sure. I, this one actually is a really good question now that I'm kind of thinking out loud. Sorry, I do that. Uh, but it's uh, uh, well, thinking about our 504 program, which is it's a, a financing program, but it's usually it's for fixed assets. And I've seen community development groups out of government, you leverage this program in order to like re rehab like office parks and things because they might have had vacant office parks and they want to bring businesses into it. And this program, because it's fixed asset financing is, is heavily used for real estate acquisition. But I'm wondering if like solar development would fit would probably fall under the fixed asset category. Now, government um, couldn't apply for it, but a small business could. So if it's a development group that is a small business working on this kind of project, or if they're leveraging you know, small businesses to help them with the project, it's definitely, I think, something worth exploring to see if they could leverage the 504 financing to help build and deliver. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm putting that out there as a question because um, I've never had anyone ask me that before. And I was just thinking like, I wonder, I think I have to go back and read our SOP, but I'm thinking there's probably ways that this could potentially work. <laughs> but definitely um, for the individual businesses, there's the financial resources if they need it, um, or there's even um, tapping into potentially some other organizations like uh, we've talked about EDA and sometimes we're able to bundle financing, you know, uh, grant initiatives from there um, bundled with maybe SBA and sometimes even USDA depending on the scope, if it's a rural based project or if it's other than that, so. That's really cool. I'm wondering personally, is the SBA potentially um, for small businesses a way to understand funding opportunities, not just within the SBA um, and understanding maybe the larger government funding opportunity landscape? We do try to stay up to date on some of those things. Um, we you know we focus largely uh, because our definition of small business is for profit. So we do tend to focus on things that are available to for profit entities as opposed to the nonprofits or government entities. Um, but we do try to keep a pulse on what's available. Um, so we will often, um, even as agencies, we sometimes partner together. Um, USDA is definitely a natural partner for us because they do have a lot of funding programs. Um, but HUD also will sometimes have, through community block grants and others, have money that might not go directly to a small business, but at the end of the day, when you follow the money, the small business is the beneficiary of it. So like from Main Street America, revitalization projects and other things. So. Um, you know, we anticipate there's there's been a lot of activity in the last 20 months. We still expect there to be more activity with the, the bills that we know uh, are being discussed and hopefully will come to fruition soon. So um, I do see that we will probably be partnering with some agencies. Uh, you know, I don't know about energy. There might possibly be some nexus there with energy as well. And then EDA is a, um, just here in Northern California. I, I, I know the woman who is our grant maker <laughs> in Northern California, and we tend to talk and sometimes try to share if we see where there might be opportunities and send people to each other to talk. So definitely worth reaching out to us to see what we might know if you, especially if you have a really specific circumstance or, or, or project that you're looking to get financial support for. And then there's also the state too, right? There's um, often ways that state programs can work in concert with the federal as well. Awesome. And then one last question. There's a dearth of Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC contractors in the green building space. A lot of capacity is needed. Does SBA provide nonprofit intermediary resources to provide capacity for these organizations? Um, do you have to be in an SBDC? Right. So our um, our grants traditionally do go to organizations that do provide the technical assistance. Um, and right now, um, those are uh, the defined ones of our, our SBDC, our, our SCORE program, Women Business Center, Veteran Business Outreach Center, and the new community navigators. We don't have any other just open um, programs that uh, an organization can apply for yet. I say yet because Again, I don't, we don't have our FY22 budget yet and infrastructure. And again, depending on what fully shakes out, we may have some opportunities coming up in the future, especially, um, I hate using the word incubator because it like 
means a hundred different things to a hundred people, but I do foresee um, potentially some programming and some dollars flowing to SBA to help support incubator type projects, accelerator type projects that will probably be in this space specifically. So under our traditional programs, there's nothing necessarily readily available, but um, it's, a, it's a watch. We're all watching to see what we actually um, are authorized and appropriated to do. So I do envision there might be some opportunities in this next year. Well, it's sounding like we would love to partner with you in specializing one for green building technologies <laughs> and can definitely follow up with your office um, with some of our resources for that. Um, thank you so much, Julie. It has been incredibly informative. And to Michelle and Elise, I cannot thank the panelists enough. And I'm going to pass it over to Carly to help wrap us up. Thanks so much. So yeah, well, that's pretty much it. We wanted to, yeah, thank everyone for being available to learn more about Justice 40 um, and then other federal and regional funding initiatives and resources available to you. And we'll be sending a follow-up email with resources from our panelists. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either Sonia or myself. Um, so thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.